idea of seeds in Genesis is that Genesis has been described as the seedbed of the Bible, that all of the themes in the entire Bible have their roots in Genesis. And, and those themes are then weaved throughout the rest of Scripture. And one of my key reasons for being excited about this part of the Bible, after looking at first principles again, comes from Job. So I want to start tonight in Job 38, if, if you'll come there with me. Because when Job was in the worst place of his life, physically and mentally, when he was walking through the valley of the shadow of death and he would have you know, preferred to have been dead, more dead than alive, he asked God to take away his life. And when he'd been pushed past the point where he was physically capable of enduring the trials that God gave to him and he was bewildered and he was frustrated and he was angry with God, he got to the point where he, he wanted a gloves-off fight with God despite the ramifications then God came to him and lifted him up and comforted him with these words of Job 38 and verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he elevated him to, to have, as it were, wings as eagles and restore Job's confidence in God and from his place of misery he elevated Job to see the world from God's eyes. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And all God did to him in the rest of chapter 38 was describe creation. Every day of creation is mentioned here in, in chapter 38. Not necessarily in order, but all of the elements of all of the days of Genesis 1 are mentioned here in chapter 38. And God didn't answer Job's questions. God didn't justify his methods and he didn't explain his reasons for treating Job and dealing with Job in the way that he did. He just simply spoke to him about creation. And through creation, it was enough that Job was comforted from the misery he'd experienced. He didn't need anything else. And after he, God had finished speaking the first time, in Job 40 and verse 4 and 5, Job says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Creation silenced Job. And when we get to chapter 42 and verse 6, Job says, I adhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Creation caused Job to want to change. That was how powerful the reasoning of God was through his revelation of creation. He wanted to change and become a better man. And this was the man that God described as a righteous man, the most righteous man in the earth that God knew at the time. He decided after hearing God's reasoning through creation that he wanted to change. And I think that's inspiring because I feel like that if, that, if God can do that with Job through looking at creation, then God can do that to us. And Genesis 1 to 3 are written to intrigue and inspire us because they're written by the Father who created us. And so he wrote Genesis 1 to 3, along with the rest of the Bible, to bring out the best of himself in us. The word was written for those that he had created. And through these chapters that we want to look at over the next four nights, God willing, we want to look at these, we hope that it will bring out these three things. This is what Genesis 1 to 3 hits us with who God is, what is his purpose, and what he wants to be. And I think that Micah summarises these perfectly in that famous quote of Micah 6 verse 8. Who God is, to do justly. What his purpose is, to love mercy and what he wants us to be, to walk humbly with thy God. That's who God is. God is righteous to do justly. 
His purpose is to love mercy and he wants us to do the same. But more than anything else, through creation, he wants us to learn to walk humbly with thy God. And often we ask in our prayers and we pray to God that God will be with us, don't we? How often do we ask God that we'll have the courage to walk with him? Because that's the change that I'm talking about. That's what creation can inspire in us. That we will walk with God. And the places that God will take us are not always easy. They're not always comfortable. But if we have the courage to go with God, then he will take us further than we'll be able to go on our own. And that's what creation will do for us. That's what the Genesis record of 1 to 3 can do for us. And so I think Micah sums that up perfectly. And the rest of the Bible that we have, the 66 books, all they do is just fill out those themes that are found in Genesis 1 to 3. But more than that, infused in each of these chapters, and particularly Genesis 1 to 3, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And for our next four nights, this is what I want to do, God willing, hopefully. This is, this is the idea. To be inspired by a father's love through Genesis 1 to 3. To discover the Lord Jesus Christ. To have our breath taken away like Job, Job had his taken away. And as a result, be motivated to change, to be changed by the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. So over four nights, that's what I'd like to do. But as I said, it's a bit of an experiment. I'm not sure how it's going to go. So we'll see. We'll see how we go. Now, God commences the, the book of Genesis. Come back to Genesis chapter 1. God commences the book of Genesis with some incredible words. And this, this verse 1 here that God opens his Bible with is how our eternal Father wants us to begin our experience with him and our experience then unfolds from this verse. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God states several facts here, either by direct inference or by indirect inference that, that set the tone for the rest of the Bible. He tells us, first of all, that the universe that we see around us was a created thing. That it was the result of a willful act and not just a haphazard accident and that it was created with intent and purpose and design. There was a beginning. There was a time before the universe did not exist, when no matter and no time existed, and then at a point in history, it began to exist, and that there were laws and principles embedded in the very fabric of creation that enabled it to sustain life, and they had to be there from the beginning in order for life to be sustained. And the other thing this verse tells us is that God was the creator. And what we begin to understand from that one verse is that God is limitless, absolutely limitless. He is the only one that has performed that creative work and he exists beyond time and beyond space. He is greater than the creation because creation is a product of his will. And his greatness is beyond anything almost that we can comprehend. And that's where I want to pause. I want to pause at Genesis 1 verse 1 tonight and I want to divert slightly and go on a little bit of a tangent because there's something else about that verse that we're not told directly but the rest of the Bible reveals. While God used Genesis 1 verse 1 to grab our attention and commence this incredible book and set the tone for the 66 <clears throat> sorry, 66 books of the Bible, it's not the beginning of the story. Our creator wrote this book for us and he deliberately withheld pieces of information to provoke the natural curiosity that he, that he created in us. And the natural curiosity in us, after reading those words, says, what was before Genesis 1 verse 1? What, what was before creation? We start to think those thoughts, don't we? What existed before that first verse of the Bible? And every time we think that, we read on in the rest of the Bible and we come across these little gems, these little gems that send us back 
to the start of the Bible and make us read again. And these gems are clues that answer that question because God tells us what existed before Genesis 1 verse 1. But you have to search for them. You have to look for them. And each time we discover one, it makes us a little more curious and a little more wiser as to the intent with which God created in the beginning. And in discovering what God feels, is, feels important to hide from us, we get to know God a little closer. This happens at least three times in the Old Testament. We already know that God existed before creation because, because it says in the beginning God created. But come over to Psalm 90 because Psalm 90 is the only Psalm of Moses and Psalm 90 tells us a little bit more information. And I don't know why Moses didn't write this as the first verse of the Bible. But he did write it for us and left it on record for us. Psalm chapter 90, verse 1 and 2. And Moses writes... Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God was before Genesis 1 verse 1. He was before the creation. And from any point in time that you choose, looking backwards for everlasting and forwards for everlasting, God was there. Because his existence is outside of creation. The creator of time is timeless and he created time for our creation, for our benefit, but he himself is not bound by it. And therefore, God can be in the past, in the present and in the future or all three at the same time if he chooses because he is not bound by time. And so you get those phrases in Revelation. I was, I, I am, I was and I, and I will be. I can't even get it right. I can't even remember what it is. I was, I am, and I, I am, I will be in the future. Because God exists outside of creation. And he's not defined by creation. He's much greater than it. And yet, at the same time, our Father ties himself to creation. His very existence, his very being, and his very reputation. And he makes promises based on time. So God holds himself to time frames, even though he himself is not bound by it. And the eternal father, who is greater than all of this, says in Exodus 25, I want to dwell with you. That's really interesting, isn't it? I want to dwell with you, my children. The second gem is found back in Genesis 1 verse 2. Now I'm going to put up an overhead because this one's got quite a bit of detail in it. The second thing we discover that existed before Genesis 1 verse 1 are the angels. So in Genesis 1 verse 3, sorry, God there is the Hebrew word Elohim. Hopefully you can read that. Is the word Elohim. And when we get to Psalm 8 verse 5, that same word Elohim is, is translated as angels. So the angels were before creation. And in Job 38 verse 7, it says that they shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. We know that verse in Psalm 103, telling us that they excel in strength, they do God's commandments, they bless God, and they minister to God doing his pleasure. And in Genesis 3 verse 22, the angels talking about the sin of Adam and Eve said, the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And what that tells us is that the angels by experience understand good and evil, just as man and woman had come to understand good and evil by experience. And yet, in Luke 20, it tells us that those that are accounted worthy will be made like unto the angels. They will not die anymore. Ephesians describes the family of God as having two parts. A family of God in heaven, the immortal angels, and part of the family is that of his children on earth, the mortal men and women who are faithful. But they are one family. 
And that immortal part in heaven, Hebrews tells us, are the angels which minister to that mortal part on earth. As mentors almost, if you will. Guiding those, men, guiding those faithful on earth in order to bring them to be at one with the Father at some point in the future when they are all made immortal. It's one family. And those angels dwell unashamedly in the presence of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the promise of God that we'll be like them. We will be like them, immortal and all-powerful like the angels. The third thing that we find that existed before creation is found in Proverbs chapter 3. Come over to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3 and verse 19. It says in Proverbs 3 verse 19, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding he hath established the heavens. And when we go over to Proverbs 8, from verse 22 to the end of the chapter, in Proverbs 8, it goes into great detail about how God used wisdom in the creation of the earth. He tells us in Proverbs 8 that God infused everything that he did in creation with his own character. He used wisdom and embedded himself in every part of creation with deliberate intent and purpose so that every part of creation could be discovered by mankind to delight and to discover over time. And the God that created us created the world around us to intrigue and inspire us and to surprise us because wherever we look, the hand of the master has been there first. There's nowhere that he has not touched. And Romans 1 tells us that that witness is, is enough alone that no one has excuse not to consider the father when they look around them at creation. Now, once we, once we begin to read the New Testament we come across two phrases that, are, that highlight where these little gems are that teach us about what existed before creation. And here, I've put them on a list here. Matthew 25 verse 34 tells us that the kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world. Second of Timothy 1 verse 9 says that we have a holy calling that involved grace before the world began. Titus 2, Titus 1, sorry. Eternal life was promised before the world began. And Revelation 13 and 17, we find that there is a book that has names written in it or not written in it. And that's been going and being, and being recorded from the foundation of the world. And what we become aware of is that every single one of these little precious nuggets that God has left for us, that sends us back to the start of the Bible to read again, are all linked to immortality. That's the one common theme between all of them. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because immortality is the normal in the universe. Mortality is abnormal. Everything around us in the invisible world is immortal, it's eternal, and it's powered by the Spirit of God. And from the very beginning, it was our Father's intention to expand his character through men and women who wanted to be a part of that immortal universe, that immortal heavenly um, realm that he dwells in, but only if they wanted to. They had to do it by their own free will and their own free choice. And so he created mortality. He created mortality as a special abnormality in the universe, as a training ground, as a preparation to allow men and women to make that choice of their own free will. And those that wanted to be part of the eternal purpose of God, well, they would live this life and then they would live in the life that was to come and those that chose not to would have this life and that would be it. But abnormality of mortality was created for that purpose, to 
to exercise free will. But at the same time, God hates the fact that anyone will miss out. God hates the fact that people might miss the opportunity to have a relationship with him. So he put a plan in place that would ensure the maximum number of people would have the opportunity to be part of that purpose as he could possibly attract. And that purpose is found in 1 Peter chapter 1. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 20, we have this revelation. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 there, we have revealed to us God's plan and the way in which he would save men and women from the foundation of the world. And when the angel appeared to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, and <clears throat> after he found out that Mary was going to have a baby, the angel said to him that this baby Jesus would save his people from their sins. And that means that right from the start, God knew that man would sin. And that's really important for us to understand. God knew that man would sin, and he had a plan from before the foundation of the world that would take care of that, that sin. He warned us. God warned us and he told us what sin would do to us and what it would do to our relationship with him. And in Genesis 2, he, he told mankind, this is what the result will be. And by experience, every man and woman that's ever lived has found out that God is right, that God is correct, that his warning was accurate. And yet God allowed mankind 4,000 years to do something about it. Look at the way that God allowed man to try. Well, he started off by giving them a perfect beginning in a beautiful garden with just one rule to follow, and they sinned. He wiped clean the earth with a flood and began again, and they sinned. He took one faithful special family and gave them special promises, and they sinned. He formed that family into a nation and gave them a law to follow, and they sinned. He gave them a promised land and judges and kings, and they sinned. He sent prophets, banished them into captivity, and brought them back again, and they still sinned. And then there was silence for 400 years from God. And after 400 years... After 400 years of silence, but after 4,000 years of history, it says here in Peter, in fulfilment of all that the law and the prophets had said, that the Lord Jesus Christ was manifested as a result of the plan that God had from the foundation of the world. And you know, John picks this up perfectly, doesn't he? In John chapter 1. Come back to John chapter 1. I love these words in John in this, in this context. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then over in verse 14, and the word was made flesh. 
You know, in the fullness of time, after 4,000 years of history, God's plan from the foundation of the world walked on this earth as a mortal man. And when you come to 1st of John, 1st of John says, that which was from the beginning, we have heard, seen, looked upon and handled the word of life. The word of God became flesh and walked among them and it wasn't a museum piece. He touched and was touched by all those he met and he was consumed like a burnt offering doing the will of God. His life had more impact on the world than anyone else in the history of mankind and the humble circumstances of his life ensured that anybody who wanted to come to the Father through that man could do so without fear of reproach or fear of rejection. There was nothing, there was nothing that you had to do, no worldly goods, no material things of this world that would be required to come to this man. And that's why God gave him such a humble birth into this world. A humble birth, a scandalous pregnancy, a birth in a barn, a humble carpenter's son, a large family, a nobody from Nazareth, a death on a cross. There is nobody in this world who could say that they weren't, that they had circumstances worse than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the very reason that God made him that way, to draw as many people to him as he could. And the cost for the individual to be involved in that plan that was ordained from the foundation of the earth, world, well, was immersion in water, wasn't it? Baptism. God made it so easy to be saved that anyone who wants to be part of that eternal plan can be. No one can say it was too hard. It's incredible, isn't it? Why did God do this? We'll just skip over the page to John chapter 3. I also love this verse in the context of, of first of Peter. God did this, John 3 verse 16 and 17, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God loved his creation. That's why he did it. He loved what he had created. He loved the generations of faithful people that he could see down through the ages who he knew were going to respond to this plan. He loved them. In fact, he loved the ones who didn't respond. So he sent his son in the manner that he did to try and draw as many people to that plan as he possibly could, to invite all to the plan of salvation. And the plan was to forgive people from their sins. Because when sins are forgiven, when they're removed, then our only response can be to mimic the life of that man that we saw walking on the earth 2,000 years ago. That's the only response, isn't it? The, the, to mimic the life that we have seen demonstrated in appreciation for being part of that plan of salvation and having our sins forgiven. And you know, Uncle Pete has just done some amazing classes on, on sin in John and what it means to us and how we, how we react to it. They're absolutely incredible classes. And if we fall short and miss the mark, then God has offered forgiveness to us. And the, and the interesting conundrum is that sin is not a problem to God, is it? Sin is a problem to us. And Uncle Pete highlighted that so incredibly. But sin is not a problem to God for the very simple fact that he has a way of dealing with it. And he has forgiven and he will forgive again. Sin's not the problem. We are the ones who have the problem with sin. We struggle with that. We hate to be wrong. We hate to have to change. But God has a plan. And what he wants us most of all is to, is to live. He wants us to live, to be inspired, to imitate his son and to take on that character. And when we do, when we appreciate that plan from the foundation of the world, come back to Peter because Peter tells us what our response will be if we truly appreciate what he has done. And it's not... It's not quite as intuitive as you think, but it is logical. So he says, 
In verse 18, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And in verse 19, but you have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Verse 21, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God. And here's the change that that inspires in us. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. That's the change that the plan of God inspires in us. It's gratitude seen in brothers and sisters who love each other. Brothers and sisters who realise the immense privilege of having an ecclesia to be a part of and a place to come to meet, and they want to be a part of that. Not because it's easy, and not because they always agree, but because they are family. And we can't choose family, can we? God didn't give us that privilege. We might wish to, but God didn't give us that privilege. He put us in this family, and he chose it for us, for our own good. But even though we can't choose our family, we can choose to place value on the members of the family that God has given us here because God places value on them. And look how much value God places on our brothers and sisters. Have a look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the word of God is eternal. For all flesh is as grass... And all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of God endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. God takes his word, which is eternal, and he writes it in the hearts and the minds of our brothers and sisters. So he places a little bit of immortality in our brothers and sisters. And if the word of God abides forever, if they allow the word of God to change them, then they too will abide forever. That's how much value God places on the brothers and sisters in our ecclesia, that he places his word in their hearts. And this was all in the mind of the Father before he even started creating in Genesis 1 verse 1. Now, how do you convey that? How do you convey all of that to your children? To those that are going to read the Bible, how do you convey all of that? Well, you start with Genesis 1, don't you? And you write Genesis 1 in a way that appeals to people of all ages, people of all standing in society, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. Everyone, regardless of their birth, their upbringing, their location, their race, the epoch of time in which they live, and that, and that it makes sense to them all. You write Genesis 1 in a way that does that. And God did that using two parallel records. First of all is the creation record, isn't it? Now, by the creation record, I mean the physical creation around us because that is a record of God's presence. And he used wisdom to embed his character in everything that we see. Creation is the single biggest witness to God's immortal presence at every level of creation. So those that were looking at the stars thousands of years ago were able to see the fingers that pointed towards a creator that brought design and logic and order out of chaos. But so is the scientist who looks under the microscope. Every level of creation points towards God and it's observable. And creation provides evidence of a God-supported life. But then we also have the Genesis record, the written word, the written record. And that tells us why creation exists. Science was created by God for for mankind to discover and delight over time. And we're still discovering incredible things about the world that we didn't know before. 
and much of science is undiscovered, still to be discovered, as long as Christ remains away. But it was something to be discovered over time. But what God wanted us to know right from day one is why he created. And the Genesis record tells us the principles behind why God created. And the record of creation seen in the physical universe around us and the Genesis 1 to 3 record must match because they're written by the same author. They have to match. They can't differ. And yet, interestingly enough, neither account actually tells us in any detail how it was done. The physical world around us, we can make observations, but really, unless we can observe things over a period of time, we we don't know how creation was done. There's so much that's unexplained. And Genesis certainly isn't a technical science textbook that tells us what was done and how it was done. You know, we have other parts of the Bible, like Ezekiel's temple or the tabernacle, that tell us in great detail the shapes and the measurements and the sizes and the look of things. For the entire creation of the universe, we have one chapter. It's not necessary to know to have a relationship with God, exactly how God did it, and I suspect we're probably not capable of understanding it. We know just two things about the creation of the universe. From Genesis 1 and other parts of the Bible in Exodus, we, God tells us it took seven days. And there's no reason to doubt that. Why would God lie, God lie to us? But he says it was done in seven days. But have a look in Psalm 33. We have one other reference to how it was done. And, and this, you'll understand what I mean when, we, when I say we probably couldn't comprehend it after we read this verse. Psalm 33 And verse 6 and 7. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. You know, by the very expression, the vapour of his breath, the universe came into being. How do, you, how do you explain that? You can't. It's incomprehensible, isn't it? And for that reason, we're not told how it was done. That's for a future time when we can comprehend it. But by the very expression of the will of the Father, the universe came into being in seven days, and that's all we are told. For now in this life, we're left with a record of creative acts that happened in a sequence to support life. And at the same time, these events were designed to teach spiritual lessons, a seedbed that, that, that created themes that go through the rest of the Bible. And I don't honestly understand why some of these patterns are there, but I know that they're there, and and I'll share them with you. There's two patterns here, that there's a pattern of of three themes, light, water, and air, and land. So day one is light, day two is the water and the firmament, day three, land and plants, and then that is repeated again in days four, five, and six. The first three days were days of, pardon me, separation, so light being divided from darkness, Waters divided above from waters divided beneath. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Waters above divided from the waters beneath. Dry land separated from water. And then God made. God made the sun, moon, and stars, the birds and the fish, the land creatures and humans. But what I want to do now is just briefly run through some of the spiritual lessons that are seen in the days of creation. And I want to pause just at two of those days probably my my two favourite days at the moment, just to consider some special lessons. So day one, light light and darkness. And that theme then goes right through the rest of the Bible. Hopefully you can read that. It's a bit small, sorry. Of God is light. Christ is light. God's word is light. We are light. And yet brotherly hate is darkness. Day two, we've got... In Hebrews 12, verse 1, 
the faithful, the cloud of faithful witnesses that we are surrounded by from Hebrews chapter 11, that unfinished record of faithful people that God is still adding to day by day. And then we've got the water below, described as the nations, nations in turmoil, but yet in, uh, in Psalm 93 there, stating that God is greater than the roaring of the seas. Dry land and plant life. We've got Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17 telling us that Faithful people are like trees. We're told in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit or the parable of the soul, which combines the earth and the plant life. But my favourite part about this day is Psalm 104. You're in Psalm at the moment. Just come to Psalm 104. And this is something to consider when you go to the beach. Psalm 104, verse 9. And he's talking about the sea. And in verse 9, he says, Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. The daily tide is a miracle, held in check by the power of the Father. When you go down to Brighton Beach, you're not, you're not concerned about where the tide is going to stop each day. It, it doesn't vary. It goes up and down several metres and is consistent in most parts of the world. It's a daily miracle that our Father in heaven is in control, keeping that tide in check for the benefit of creation. Day four. Now, we often talk about day four as being the sun, moon and stars created, but just come back to Genesis chapter, chapter one. And look at the reason that the sun, moon and stars were created. Genesis 1 verse 14. This is my favourite day of them all at the moment. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The reason that the lights were put in the firmament in their position was so that we could chart time. We could plot time. And we could plot progress over time. You know, I often thought that God's greatest gift to mankind in the natural sense was fire. Because mankind can understand fire, but the animals cannot. The second greatest gift that God gave mankind was time. To be able to plot a progress of their life over time. So when the sailors are out at sea, they look up at the stars, they know their position, and they can judge their position over time based on the, the... the measurement of the stars. Events in the, in the skies, like uh, the regular return of Halley's Comet and other, other phenomenons, can be predicted, and time can be, time can be plotted based on those events. We know that there is plenty of, um, plenty of calendars and um, stone, I don't, I don't know what you call them, stone edifices in Aztec, you know, temples and that sort of thing, that mark the winter and the summer solstice and the spring and the winter equinox based on the position of the sun in the sky. God gave man the ability to plot time because in Psalm 90, verse 12, he says, teach us to number our days and to apply our hearts to wisdom. That's why he gave us the ability to plot time. And in Daniel 12, He also uses those same elements in the sky to inspire us. So he says, the faithful are going to shine like the stars to inspire us to wonder about the majesty of the Father who dwells in heaven, who had the capability of putting all of those elements of heaven there in their place. That's why day four is my favourite. Day five. We've got birds and fish. This one's a little bit obscure and, and I'm sure you've probably got more to add to this. But when we read Psalm 40, that God will give strength to the weary. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. It's a symbol of God's strength, isn't it? But he also told his disciples, the Lord also told his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to draw people to this purpose of salvation that God has has worked through his son. And then in day six, well... Beasts are really symbols of all mankind, but in particular, in the Ecclesia, we have Acts 10 verse 28 there. God said 
to Peter, call not... Uh, no, I'm not even going to try and make it. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it wrong. Don't call common what I've called clean. You know? And humans, humans are capable of being reborn and their minds renewed so that they are new creatures in Christ. So there's just some spiritual lessons out of the six days of creation. That then, And you're familiar with all of those themes and you've probably got many more that you'd be able to add to that list. But these are just ones that I, I know of and, and can share and, and the reason that, that I've put them in there. And so Genesis chapter 1, what we've looked at tonight, is 1 verse 1. Everything started with God and yet God didn't begin creating with, without a plan. He had a plan in place before he started creating. And that plan is weaved in and, 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 and revealed to us in little secret nuggets that are hidden all the way through the Bible. It tells us what his intention was even before he started creating, before Genesis 1 verse 1, and what existed with the Father before he started creating. And then we've looked at some little lessons there that, that form the spiritual feedbed, spiritual seedbed. And those themes then weave throughout the rest of Scripture and become and become the Bible as we know them. So we'll leave it there tonight, God willing. And what we want to look at uh, in two weeks' time is Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. We want to have a look at the seventh day under the theme of, and God rested.